24 hours to go. Tomorrow is the Beast Spartan race in Windsor and the culmination of hours and hours of training. There is no help, there is no assistance. It is just my body, my mind, my heart and my fancy pants new watch. Day. So what have I been doing for the last 24 hours? Playing with this and I am in love with it already. More on that in a second. What's the plan today? A 22 kilometer and 33 obstacle course race uh, in Windsor, home of the Queen. Although looking at the map, that's closer to Bracknell than Windsor, but um, I guess Spartan Bracknell didn't have the same ring. I used to run in a Polar watch years ago. The first Apple Watch came out. I thought, that's cool, I'll buy one of those. I bought it, I realized it was nothing more than a gimmick that meant you didn't need to take your phone out of your bag. Rubbish, got rid of it. Replaced it with a Fenex 5. Loved it, gave me all the running data I could possibly use. Then they released Apple 4, and I thought, do you know what? They've, they've kind of nailed now the whole cellular thing, and I got this, and uh, this strap on here is my desperate attempt to try and make it look sporty, failing miserably. I can go for a run, and it tracks much of the data that I would need, certainly when I get back home and I download it onto an app. It's brilliant at being able to stream my podcast, my music. I can take calls, texts, I can get hold of people. I don't need to take my phone out and about, but... I can't wear it at obstacle course races because it is a little ball of glass and too fragile and I'm sure there are people out there now saying, I wear mine, well done. I'm not wearing this, I do not want to break it. So, it's no good for obstacle course races uh, and I started to fall out of love with it for running. It just doesn't give me enough data. I'm now starting to do half marathons and so I need, need I would like more information on how my splits are going during the run and this just does not cut it. Also, when my hands are wet or it's raining, we're now coming into winter, or even just sweaty, I can't swipe the screen. It's starting to do my head in. And so they released the Garmin Fenix 6, and I thought, do you know what, maybe I want one. And I was actually quite sensible. I went and bought off of Gumtree, second hand, although in as new condition, a lesser Garmin model. I don't even know what model this is. Um, but I bought it, I've used it for a couple of runs, did a half marathon with this the other week, and I absolutely loved the data that I could get on the fly. It was telling me my split time, my, my running time in the current split I was in, it was giving me my predicted finish time, all sorts of stuff. Blew the Apple Watch away, and it also didn't need an exaggerated wrist turn to make it come on and show me the information. I could also stop it and start it with a button. No swipey rubbish. Thought, I love that. But it's a plastic, cheaper one. It's no good for obstacle course racing. Enter the Fenix 6. As soon as I took it out of the box, I thought this, that I've just nailed it. This is absolutely perfect. The one I've gone for is uh, the 6X. X for big, it's the biggest one they do. It's also the Sapphire screen, not the Pro Solar. The Pro Solar is actually more expensive, so it's the higher model. And it gives, obviously, solar power and therefore longer battery life, but the longer battery life takes it from being an incredibly long battery to being an insanely long battery. I'm still getting about 15 hours of battery. I don't run races longer than 15 hours. The longest I do are, occasionally I do a 50K run locally. I do that about five and a bit hours. So I have plenty of battery life from this. The bigger issue is that the non-solar one comes with the sapphire glass because I don't need the solar power, but I am wearing it on obstacle course races I went for the harder glass without the extra battery life. We will see how it copes today. We are going to strap it to a 220 pound man and have him run for three or four hours through the woods, over obstacles, under things, around things, through things, and see how it comes out the other side. The hope is unscathed, at least mostly unscathed. I was using my Mudman G-Shock, which I adore for riding the motorbike because if this gets broken on the motorbike, it means I'm already very dead. This is indestructible, but all it gives me is the time elapsed. Stopwatch, not enough. 
the hope today is I'm going to get all sorts of stuff off of this. I'm going to get my heart rate monitored. I'm going to get the elevation, the climbs, the descents. I'm going to get my split times. Will it be useful? <laughs> Who knows? Who cares? It will be exciting to look at. And it's so much. You could well imagine Stallone or Lundgren or whatever 80s action hero they drag out to be in that Expendables 48. Check in time left on the mission on this thing. It is big, it is aggressive, it is. Would Sylvester Stallone check his mission duration time on this? No, no he would not. If they release Expendables 96 and he is checking his mission time on this, Apple have paid an obscene amount of money for that to happen. So we are out of here. I'm gonna strap this on and get over to we are here, and I thought I was being a little bit mean with the Bracknell thing, but now that I know exactly where we are, we are one mile down the road from Bracknell Sports Centre. Um, anybody travelling from overseas thinking, this is an odd place for the British Royal Family to have set up shop, I can assure you, they don't live here. So everything is sorted, I've done some last minute checks on my kit, the watch is working perfectly, my heart rate is 51 beats a minute, so a little bit stressed. What is this? This is... This, it's this watch in its natural environment. I've been looking at Tesla car reviews lately. The ones that have made me think, I gotta get me one of those, are the ones where someone sticks their 95 year old grandmother in the passenger seat and does naught to 60 in 2.4 seconds. It's, it's that, it's using the thing out there, handing out coronaries to old people. That's what this is. It's with this watch on, doing an obstacle course race, how will it fare? Is it gonna get scratched to pieces? Is it gonna come back looking abused after one day? Is the strap gonna snap? Are the buttons gonna stop working when it gets dirty and gritty? It's this watch in the wild doing what it's supposed to do. It will unlikely hand out coronaries to anybody, although in the age group I run in, you can never be too sure. So the clock is ticking and we are off and running. This is my fifth Spartan race, my second beast. I did the beast in Scotland last month as well. Running in the 45 to 50 age group and my plan as always, although I've never yet achieved it, is to try and finish in the top half of my age group. I am not a natural build for this sort of event so top half would be superb going over the four foot walls, nice and straightforward. My hope is to just try and keep the bulk of the runners in my age group in sight. I can't beat them straight out running, but, uh, but if I can keep them in sight, then hopefully get lucky on the obstacles. That's the plan. Just going over the, uh, the over and under obstacle here, and you can see the, the foliage on the floor. That's what this course was like throughout. It was a pretty flat course. There weren't many hills of any significance at all but a lot of stuff on the ground. Fallen trees, logs, a lot of debris on the floor, a lot of forest debris, and a lot of boggy conditions as well, jumping over ditches and streams, a lot of muddy sections as well. Six foot walls, nice and straightforward. Okay, let's rattle through some of these obstacles. So we've got the tunnels, looks pretty easy, but the sort of thing you'd go and bend down and put your back out on. The A-frame, I'm not sure why, but I find it an obstacle that I can make a bit of ground up on. Long arms, long reach maybe. No problems at all going over there. So off of the A-frame, back into the woods. Again, you can see the conditions, very muddy underfoot. At this point, I was just trying to keep my trainers dry. It was almost inevitable they were going to get wet at some stage. I figured they were not going to have this much water on the ground and not use it as an obstacle at some stage. But if I could clear ditches like this and keep them dry for the most part, then that could only be a good thing for as long as it was possible. Coming up on Bender obstacle, pretty straightforward one. Checking on the watch to get an idea of the time gone so far. I'll come on to how useful it was to have the watch in a moment. Bender's an easy one, up and over. Mm. 
More walls, seven foot walls. Again, more water to avoid. It would have been an awful lot faster just to blast through this and not worry about getting wet. But in a race that I knew was gonna be taking hours, the last thing I wanted to do was have wet trainers early on. And the first of the carries, the jerry can carry. Not done it before, but it's pretty obvious what you need to do. Grab two of those cans and take them around the course. I was gonna say they're a favorite obstacle of mine. They're not a favorite, I just happen to be okay at them. The weights that we're lugging around are not huge relative to my own weight. So I tend to be able to make up some ground on the carries. Everybody's going at walking pace, so the runners have no advantage. If anything, my longer stride is more beneficial. I don't tend to need to stop and rest on the carries. So I'm normally able to catch and pass a few people here. We're having to chuck our jerry cans across the ditch i managed to get past two there and then a little bit further on i managed to go past the other three so five people passed on that one obstacle and there is very little doubt that at some point during the next couple of kilometers running they will probably catch me up and go on ahead again but i take my little victories where i can get them so checking on my pace at this point, it's about six and a half minutes per kilometre, which given we'd done a lot of obstacles and run over some rough ground was not too bad. This is the rope traverse. I had first encountered this obstacle in Scotland last month and I had gone across it, as you can see the people doing there, by hanging underneath. And it had exhausted my arms and it put a rope burn in the back of my legs that I still have now. I'd also seen people going across the top of the rope, but I had no intention of learning that new skill in the middle of a race. So my plan was to go underneath it again and just put up with getting more rope burns until I saw this guy next to me. He hops on the rope and he's off. And I thought, I need to be doing that. So, I balanced on the rope, expecting to fall off at any moment. And the second I started pulling myself forward, holy shit, that's easier. I realized how easy it was. At one stage, I started to wobble a bit and I just had to pause to get my balance back, but no big deal. This obstacle done this way is easy. There is no other word for it. I would be amazed if I fell off this obstacle um, you literally get a rest, you're lying down. If you come to the rope traverse, trust me, go on top of the thing. Sandbag carry, again, carrying heavy things, I like these, no problems here. Again, because Windsor was a flat course, the carries were flat as well. So, sandbag carry, no problems. Barbed wire crawl, not normally a big deal, but as you'll see when I get down the ground, You've got broken twigs and sticks stabbing into you. you. Come up too high, you're getting hit by the barbed wire. It was a grim surface to crawl through. There's a surprise, some more walls. Actually, I've labeled these seven foot walls. I'm not sure if these, these look about seven foot. Maybe the ones previously were eight foot. I don't know, it was just a wall taller than me. Okay, and then Twister. I failed Twister twice and worked on my grip strength non-stop. And the last time I had the Twister in Scotland, I nailed it just. So I was reasonably confident going into this, except it was wet. You can see even the camera's got moisture all over it. The bars were the same. I knew it was gonna be hard to hold on. I started off by going backwards, which is what I'd done previously, and it worked well for me. It's a real balance here between taking enough rest to get your breath back and tackle the obstacle with some energy and spending ages wasting time on an obstacle that you might then fail and have to penalty for. So hard to know what to do. Get on with it. It's probably the best, the best technique. So I went across the first section of three, reasonably straightforward, got into the second section, and then my body started swinging underneath it. 
my hand positions were going all over the place. I wasn't going backwards anymore, now going sideways. It's all starting to go a little bit pear-shaped here. Just watching this back is grim. Unfortunately, at this point, I fall off. The reason I fell off was pretty straightforward. I couldn't hold any longer. Looking back at it, I had one hand overhand grip, one hand underhand grip, and I tried to go from an underhand grip to an overhand grip on the other side of the bar to catch hold of a handle that is obviously moving at that point should not have failed. Very, very annoying. Okay, so what do you do after failing an obstacle that you know you can do? You go and fail another one. Olympus, I have always said that this is an obstacle that although I had never failed before, I was always on the edge of falling off. I've always struggled with it. You have, as you can see, three options, the climbing grips, the holes or the chains. The chains are useless. I don't think anybody uses those. I go for the holes, but my hands struggle to fit in the small gap. That's my excuse. And it was wet and slippy. It was just an absolute nightmare this time around. I had no grip for my shoes at all. It was my knees that were holding myself against the board. At one point, I literally fell flat against the board, trying to hold my feet up behind me. I now laid on the board, managed to pull myself back up, went for another grip and fell off. And unfortunately this time there were burpees. So my first set of 30, marvellous. Why am I even holding on to the chain? Pointless. So I checked to see if it's still a slippy piece of skinny metal, and it was. Stupid obstacle. Checking on my pace here. In fact, it would be easy to think that having your pace available, your split times and so on, during an obstacle course race would be of no value. And it is true that it would be of more value in a regular routine race, a 5K, 10K, half marathon, whatever. And I can't wait to use the watch in those sort of races as well. But it was genuinely beneficial here. The only thing was I had to keep changing my targets, changing my goals. So for example, here we've got 7.35 minute per kilometer, and that's sliding all the time. The obstacles, how to do burpees, is pushing that further and further down. So my objective was never to keep it at a certain point, but to stop it sliding too far. So I'd look at it, I'd see what it was telling me, and if it had slipped to 740, I'd pick the pace up. It just gave me a little oh, extra oh, kick oh. To, uh, to push me forward. And what's interesting, this girl that comes running past is the first of the age group females that set off after us. So she's probably 10, 15 minutes behind, has now caught me up. And as she came past, I figured that she was going at a pace just a bit quicker than me. So, a bit like following an ambulance in traffic, I just sat behind her. Don't follow ambulances through traffic, that's ridiculous. It's just an example. It doesn't matter. Hopefully I wasn't annoying her, because I followed her for quite some way, and it pulled me forward. Um, I had to increase my pace to stay with her, I thought I was running at, I thought I was running as fast as I could go. Clearly not. Um, very, very useful. In the same way as having the watch to, by the way, we're at the plate drag, easy, pulling things, no big deal. So yeah, in the same way as being able to look at the watch and think, oh, okay, I don't want to drop any more of my pace, pick it up a little bit, a little kick, uh, following someone else that's going a bit faster, just proves that you always have more inside you than then you give out and it's just about finding a way of tapping into that the watch was doing that for me again the girl who i'd overtaken at the plate drag consistently quicker than me so again sat behind her for some way and again suddenly found that even on this climb had a bit more pace in me than i thought i did just need that little extra kick Okay, the rings. Um, I think Spartan call this a multi-rig because everywhere else in the world it seems to consist of lots of things hanging from the bars. We just have rings. I have never failed the rings 
but I went into this a little bit apprehensive, having just messed up the two previous grip strength obstacles. The rings were really low, and if you're tall, it meant that you had to hook your legs up out the way to stop them from banging on the ground. Oh, it almost felt like my knees were gonna to touch the ground. And because my legs were hooked up, I had no momentum or no ability to get momentum. And I couldn't get that kind of Tarzan thing going on from one to the next. In fact, at one point, I messed it up so much that I decided to actually skip a ring and jump straight across to the second one. Pulled it all together by the end, got off the obstacle. But it wasn't as simple as it should have been. Balance beam, pretty straightforward. Walk across the beam, don't fall off. Bucket carry, good. More heavy things to lug around. Happy with that. Wire crawl, second time. More opportunity to rough up the watch and put it through its paces though, I guess. Atlas carry, no problems there. There's actually another carry as well, which is basically an Atlas ball with a chain on it that you just haul around on a handle. Didn't film that for some reason, camera didn't work. Not a tricky obstacle for me, like that one. Two Atlas carries, one wire crawl would be a better way to go. Rope climb, never failed it, pretty straightforward. I always say this every time, if you fail the rope climb, it's because you haven't learned how to climb a rope. It's not a complicated or physically draining task. Another carry, there were a lot of carries on this. Two bags, a bucket, what else do we carry? The Atlas balls, the jerry cans. Good, more carrying, we like carries. Okay, and we are coming towards the end. Um, at this point, I can see the event field, so I know I'm back towards the beginning. Come up onto the slip wall. Pretty straightforward, cargo net over that. Z wall is a bit like Olympus. I've always been able to complete it but it's always felt a bit close. Um, this time though, no drama. Okay, and now it gets good. Spear throw. Bit of luck, but that's no bad thing. Nailed the spear throw. Okay, now you know how, you know how I was saying that you've always got a bit more inside you and you just need to release that the spear throw released it for me. I come to the hoist. There are six guys already on the hoist in front of me. This event took me three hours, 16. So that is over 11,000 seconds. I needed just 10 to overtake all of them. This is the only 10 seconds in the entire race where being heavy and strong is beneficial. Just 10 seconds and they are here. I hoisted the thing up in the air, I put it down, and I left the obstacle. Everybody that was on the obstacle when I arrived is still on the obstacle, and I'm off. And I'm over the wall, and I'm sprinting like it is the end of a park run. In fact, I even nearly knock over the kid that's trying to give me a medal. And I'm done. <laughs> The old man, the oldest man, 45 are dead. <laughs> <laughs> Three points I need to cover. First of all, qualification to the OCR World Championships was achieved with that result by 10 seconds. So always sprint finish is the motto there. And it's quite handy as well because weeks and weeks ago, when I had no expectation of qualifying for the World Championships, I went and ordered the United Kingdom t-shirt for the World Championships with my name on the back. Um, so it would have been rather embarrassing and a large waste of money had I not qualified. So I'm not sure what the motto to that is. Um, put your money where your t-shirt is, who knows? So that's good, next Saturday, off to the World Championships. Number two, the watch, absolutely, 
delighted with it. It is in mint condition. I've given it a wash when I got back. There is literally not a mark on it anywhere. Um, new strap that I got today for it. It's as new. Now, admittedly, it wasn't as bashed about as it could be. The World Championships actually next Saturday will be interesting because it's a lot more... Um, it's, it takes place at the nuclear race event. If you've done a nuclear race, you'll know how uh, destructive they can be on the body, let alone bits attached to you. So it'd be interesting to see how it gets on there. But it wasn't an easy day out for the watch and it came out of it completely unscathed. And the information was genuinely useful throughout. Being able to check my pace, my time, my heart rate was motivating. Um, in fact, forget whether it was useful, it was motivating, which made me faster, which made me qualify for the World Championships. It was worth it. It gives huge amounts of data that is going to be really, really helpful, especially when I do some proper runs that it's going to really assist with. Some half marathons, some 10Ks, where I can work on my pace properly. The new Pace Pro feature that lets you run negative splits and all sorts. Very, very cool. So, result very, very happy with that. And the last thing, I mentioned earlier on that the spear throw was lucky. And I'm going to take that back and I'll show you why. I failed the spear throw three times. I went, I built my own spear. I practiced and practiced and practiced. The last three spear throws, I've hit every single one. You make your own luck and you make your own spear. <laughs> <laughs>